Well, that's what said Chairman Zabonso in that green kaftan. He did not go to sit on the seat that we, we know that is reserved for the majority leadership, the black one. And as we go on, we're going to show the, the videos to you again. He decided to sit somewhere else. And if some hand gestures that we saw him do, the man who was in the chamber, who was closer to the action and heard what we are seeing, because the, the voice of for sentiments are not audible enough for you to, to hear in that video that we just played to you. Konwa Kuche was in Parliament today. He's our Chief Parliamentary Correspondent. He's joining us on Zoom. And then also Duke Mensah Poku uh, is uh, with uh, Political Desk here at Media Journal. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Komala, now this video we just played, you witnessed it live in Parliament. What exactly, beyond the gestures of Osemi uh, Chimensah throwing his hands, what, what was he saying? And what was he responding to? So, I mean, Alfred, uh, when he walked into the chamber, uh, this was just around, uh, I'm trying to get the time code and recorded this. This was just a little around um, 12.41. Okay, so exactly at 12.41, that was when Osei Chaymen Sabonso walked into the chamber, I saw him briefly from uh, where we normally call the tunnel. You know, he had walked together with his aide and his security, you know, from the tunnel. And from that lane, there's a checkpoint there. It's the same side that the speaker uses to his office as well. And so, uh, but, but I mean, it's, it's mostly the mid zone area that normally the media does interviews and so that, I mean, especially when you want to grab the president, you a quick one, you know, you can just do it there. Then I saw him, but from where I was, I was at the opposite. By the time I I ran towards him, I realized that no, he had already entered the speaker's lobby area, heading towards the chamber. So I had to quickly rush back to the chamber, and I got him in. In fact, the gestures that he made when. When he walked in, there wasn't too much applause or reaction, you know, normal as compared to what happened during the uh, minority one, where you know, when they walked in, there was you know a lot of shouting here and there and all that. Uh, the Haruna Idris which time they were giving him funds and all that. It didn't really happen around this time. But when Chimenez sat down from across the aisle, that gesture that you saw, in fact. Immediately he sat down, his chief whip, uh, the, the deputy whip, that's the Tolong MP, had approached him or tried approaching him from where he was trying to beckon him to move from that side and come to the black leather seat. But he shook his head and said no. Then across the aisle, the mi minority leadership was drawing his attention. Um, the minority chief whip and also the minority leader were drawing his attention to the fact that he should come and occupy the uh, front seat or the leader seat. And he said, no, from what I had and saw, he said, I have left it. This mm -hmm. is where I will sit. That's the meaning of the gesture that I came see. around. I have left it. This is where I will sit. Yeah. And so, I mean, it actually drew the, uh, the uh, further attention of his quipped, and then also Obi Amwa, who came to him, if I just spoke to him for close to about uh, four to five minutes, but he would not agree to anything. Then there were other senior M MPs who had come to him again and spoken to him and said, no, everybody was uh, really trying to get him to move from there because one, this is, uh, I mean, it's just 24 hours it happened and there hasn't been any arrangement in terms of the seating Positions. I recall last night we spoke about this, the difficulty they may face, you know, getting him a position. And so he only had to sit uh, at Katie Hamill's place and then, you know, all of this before he moved towards 
uh, the chair, there was one other senior MP, I've, I've just forgotten his name, who had to speak with him. Because of the level of respect he had for him, he moved towards his seat, which he resigned from yesterday. And he spent not more than two minutes on that. Mm. From there, he walked towards the first deputy speaker, Joseph Osei Wusu, uh, who was engaging the body MP, Samson Ahi, at the time. And so Samson Ahi had to make way for him. And where Joe Osei sat is normally where the deputy speaker sits. And uh, at the time, the speaker himself was in the chair. The first deputy speaker was right. in the house. And so I, I it was see. only him and then, yeah. Super stuff. Come out. So that's the video we are seeing. Um, on the screen right now, what you've been speaking to. So we see Osei Chairman Sabonso in that green kaftan, and we see Abib Idris and uh, Obi Amoa talking to him uh, to, to get him to move to that black seat at the front row. He, he declined. He said he's not going to do that. And, and he's, he decided to still sit at that place. Now, we see a number of the, the MPs walking out to him to, to talk to him. And this is the point that you say they were trying to convince him to come and sit on the majority leader seat that he has resigned from. He says, no, he's not going to do that. He's not going to sit. And when he entered, we, we, we're going to see the hand gestures right now uh, that he was responding to that this is where he wants to sit. That's what we're seeing in there. And th this was in, in response to the minority calling. Yes, and this was from across. This was the call from across the aisle. And it's, normally they talk to each other from across the aisle. And I mean, if he has to deal with Maybe there's some some understanding that they need to have or what you normally call uh, there's a word they use for I think it's overchair they right overchairs to each other you know they speak but I mean if you're on the floor itself you can hear what they say and if the place is a bit quiet I mean those of us at the media uh, stands or the public gallery you can hear them if the microphones are not on you can hear them whenever they speak but. That was what he said. And he said, no, he wasn't going to sit there. Uh, he had to go towards his seat, spending only two minutes there before going to Joseph Osewusu, whom he spent less than a minute and a half with. I kept timing him on that because I was keenly monitoring to see what exactly was going on. And shortly thereafter, he moved back to uh, his retired black leather seat and then he picked up his blue file. That blue file normally, you know, contains the books that he uses. He comes to the house with a lot of books, the standing orders, the constitution, and any other relevant document that he needs. But if there's any document he needs to sign, normally his aides or his assistants, they, they carry that file and it's in with. And in fact, when he got in today, he had to sign some document. Uh, word is out there that it was actually uh, a consent to uh, the business statement which will be given tomorrow before the house will break for the weekend. And so he, he had to also append his signature to that. And so uh, it, 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 it's, it, was, it was just a very brief thing. And shortly after that, he moved to the speaker's uh, lobby within the chamber area and had some... Um, talks with a lot of the majority MPs, especially from the Ashanti region. Uh, I saw about four of the Ashanti region MPs surrounded uh, 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 who, who were around him. Okay. Uh, well, as to what they were speaking, of course, the media is not allowed to get Obviously, closer to, to, that to, to side, get closer. So we had to wait until he walked out of the uh, And Kormar, talking about the media and your work there in Parliament, and we, we're going to hear from Jose, who's, uh, you, all of you just uh, approached him for an interview earlier today because of the stance that he, together with a number of the senior MPs, NPP MPs, had taken about this whole conversation about changing uh, Jose Chimes Abonso as majority leader prior to yesterday his voluntary resignation. Dr. Rashid Rahman is joining us as well. Uh, is the uh, executive director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Thank you, sir, for joining us. But first off, let's hear from Joe Seusu. Uh, he spoke to uh, the parliamentary press call earlier today, responding after Osei Chemen Sabonso's resignation. Bear in mind, he addressed that press conference
two days ago. What did he have to say about Osage Mensa Bonsu's decision to resign? Take a look. He decided to stand down. He has been a fantastic leader, an extremely hard-working person, and I would have wished that he stayed on till the end. So did he come to you as a surprise? Yes, he did. But as to what got to him, I'm sure we better let him explain. The manifesto committee's suggestion or was made to him before he resigned. At that time, he had not contemplated resigning. So I don't think it would have caused any... Uh, defect in his work. As anybody of who have been close to him knows, he's extremely hardworking and he can sit from morning to morning if there's work to be done. Now there's confusion being thrown into the interpretation of our standing orders, which we are so proudly touting that we have done by the speaker himself. So we will have to re-look <laughs> re at the interpretation. Uh, yesterday I spoke that I had an alternative interpretation. I understand that Norbert Thatcher also spoke that he had a different and alternative interpretation. So we will look at the interpretation as contained in. But I, I, I certainly I can't see how you can interpret standing orders of parliament to bring in a party which is not a member of parliament. That interpretation I can't see where the basis of that and for me that is a confusion that has been thrown into the interpretation of the new standing orders by Mr. Speaker himself. Then why then did the Speaker interpret this when there is no ambiguity? I'm not sure you can call this an interpretation because an interpretation comes about when there is disagreement as to the meaning of a particular clause or order. There was no such thing. I thought the Honourable Member for Tamale North was making a comment in jest. So, um, the speaker's opinion could, should not and could not be called an interpretation. He's only offering an opinion. And that's why, if it were an interpretation, uh, I wouldn't have had the courage or even the opportunity to offer an alternative one. But as to opinions, his opinion is different from mine. As to the meaning of that, it's different from that of the Honorable Attach. What is important is that in this case, there's spe there are specific provisions, definition of who the leader is, and so on. So, uh, I think he only offered his opinion as to whether. That's why I said I had an alternative opinion, and Honourable Attach also offered an alternative opinion. But unfortunately, you media men have captured the speaker's opinion as if it is the interpretation of the standing orders. That is not the case. A political party, yes. But the political party offers me the ticket to seek election in a constituency. The constituency is part of the country. Then we are here to make laws for the country. And interpreting what the law means, it's not only the party's uh, position or interest that should influence what you think. Even at the party's level, we argue, we disagree and agree before we reach a consensus. So there's nothing wrong with having different interpretations to what uh, a clause or otherwise means. Well, what, what would you say to those? Well, in fact, so that's what the uh, Chair Mensa Bonsu, uh, resignation and conversations there. You see Jose also, also MP for Bekwai and also first Deputy Speaker of Parliament there. And, and, and the, uh, as we go on in, in this conversation he had with journalists, he was talking about the fact that Oseche Mensa Bonsu Komla ha, had actually accepted to chair this uh, manifesto committee even before he decided to, to resign. And so that could have never had any bearing on this decision. And uh, that's where I bring in uh, in fact, Duke Mensah Poko as well has been monitoring uh, tomorrow. We understand, Duke, there's going to be a meeting uh, that the NPP will decide who indeed would lead the party in, in, the, in Parliament going forward. Because on Tuesday, the President, all things being equal, is expected to s deliver the State of Nation address. And a leader, yeah. a majority leader, will have to be present to receive him uh, for that matter. What are we picking tomorrow? Yes, so what we are uh, picking or what we are dreaming is, is that the only agenda for the National Council meeting tomorrow, and the National Council is the highest decision 
making body up the new patriotic party in the absence of um, the annual delegates conference, which is um, the meeting of the entire party. Now, the NTV constitution stipulates in Article 14 too, that um, the election of the leaders of the parliamentary group is the sole preserve of the National Council. Now, of course, this is notwithstanding the fact that the um, party um, has probably taken uh, judicial notice or have taken notice of the discussions surrounding the new standing orders and whether it's interpretation or opinion. But it's written white and black in the new patriotic party's constitution that it is within the purview of the National Council to elect the leader. So it was in the spirit of that 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 conversation started on Monday at the National Council meeting, which eventually was botched. What we are told, or what we are doing, what we are learning, of course, I have cited a copy of the notice that has gone out inviting all members of the National Council to that meeting, which is set up for 9 a.m. tomorrow at the um, Alista Hotel. What we are thinking is that there's a list of five persons um, that will be presented to National Council to deliberate upon and then sign it off, after which there will be an official communication that this is the leadership, the new leadership of the new patriotic party that will be presented uh, to Parliament and, of course, by extension to the entire country. So the list, as uh, we are picking up, of course, Alexander Senior Martin was told would be the leader um, of the House. The deputy leader, um, uh, interestingly, um, the person order has seen from what we heard on Monday. The deputy leader was told would be Madame Patricia Akuje, um, who has been in Parliament um, since 2012. Uh, um, and the, depu the, the majority chief whip will remain um, the Honorable Frank Anodompre, MP for Sao Madreji. Third deputy would be Habib um, Idrisu, MP for Tolong. Um, and then Alexander Junobu, assistant MP for Sejia Kontomba, would become the second deputy majority whip. So this is the list that we hear has been deliberated upon, approved, and would be presented to National Council tomorrow at that crucial National Council meeting for deliberation to um, ensue after which everything will be firmed up and then an official presentation or presentation or official communication will be made uh, to the uh, Parliament of Ghana after which these new changes will take effect. But of course, just to give just to give further context to what happened, Alexander Jonobu Akete, who previously used to be a backbencher, said the video that um, we showed viewers earlier on today, we could see that he had moved from the back bench to the front bench. So interestingly, what Tay Mensa Bonsu moved a seat back to where usually Kate Yamon would sit. Um, Alexander Junobu Atete, who is in pencil down or mentioned as the second deputy chief with, today we saw him on the front benches, which means that the message that was communicated or the deliberations that were, that came to life, if you like, at the crucial meeting at the Jubilee House last night with the president has to confess. Of course, members of parliament and Kamala will tell you that they are liberty. Usually, even though the speaker doesn't like it, he would usually want MPs to sit in their chairs and then communicate so that he can identify them with microphones and identify their names in the room. But, so usual, but usually, MPs usually lose me when the house, no serious business is happening. They usually move around, except that you don't go and sit in mind. But sometimes, even they do go to the minority side, majority of people are discussing. But if you monitor for things, Alex Zonobo seems to be so much um, uh, enamored by his new position that he, he was in that chair for the greater part of the day, essentially to confirm what is in the media that he will be the second deputy. So interesting names, Alfred, coming, coming up, like, but uh, going by the strict dictates of the new patriotic party constitution, irrespective of whatever the speaker's interpretation or opinion, as Joe Joe uh, says, in relation to the new standing orders, the MPP is still sticking, going by its constitution, and would want to, uh, want to have a better way to ratify right. these changes before. You know, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Now, let me bring in Dr. Ashir Damanan there, um, is the executive director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. You made the strong point uh, that, in your view, you're convinced Osaiche Mensa Bonsu was, quote, pushed out. Why are you convinced that this is indeed what happened? Uh, Alfred, if you put the string of events, I mean, from Monday 
uh, up until the point of his resignation yesterday, uh, I think there is, I mean, only one conclusion that you can come up with. First of all, the, I mean, it looks like from the press conferences, from uh, maybe speaking to members of the caucus, I mean, you get the impression that nobody was aware of uh, of this, I mean, change that was that was coming. Uh, it looks like maybe there were only, perhaps maybe only those who were going to uh, be given those positions were aware. Uh, then you fast forward to after the resignation, you hear again the likes of the first deputy speaker once again saying he was very disappointed that uh, the majority leader resigned. And, and again, for me, like, I mean, I said yesterday, uh, majority leaders don't resign. In our democracy, uh, we haven't seen that happen before. Uh, there is always a negotiated exit based on some very nice consensus and nice conversation, uh, even if that's what is presented to the public between the caucus and the party. But this time around, I think uh, we haven't seen that happen. So you put all these together, uh, I think you see an end to a beautiful and gallant legislative career that uh, that 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 seems to be sitting on rocks. I see, but uh, the, the likes of uh, Andy Apia Kobe and then also Joshua also talk about the implications or ramifications of this development of Osage Mensa Bonzo resigning. From where you sit, what would be the possible implication of this development going forward? Well, I mean, the, first of all, uh, yeah, in terms of the unity of the caucus, as you know, Alfred, and we have said this before, uh, the, the majority side in parliament has most of the time struggled to get uh, at, I mean, most of the time whenever there is a problem with Koro, I think the problem emanates from their side, mostly because of the constitutional arrangement. A number of them are ministers of state, so sometimes they are tending to uh, executive business and the business of our country. Uh, if you have a situation where uh, you add a few members of the caucus who are not happy with what is happening, then there's going to be a struggle for the government to get government business done in the house. Number two, um, the first deputy speaker has been one of the vocal critics of how this uh, whole thing was handled. He most of the time presides in the absence of the right honorable speaker. Uh, you don't want uh, uh, a presiding officer who has issues with a particular caucus to be in the chair because, you know, he or she can frustrate, you know, the caucus. And in this case, this caucus happens to be the majority caucus. Then you also have number three, the man in the center of the storm himself who has been one of the uh, the best I mean, MPs that we have currently in the House, in terms of experience, in terms of attention to detail, in terms of how serious it takes the work of the House, both in the plenary and outside the plenary. If you have people like him beginning to withdraw and not give the, their best, then 
the ramifications are huge for you know, indeed the, and, and that's right. We'll see how things play out. And in fact, with the information we're picking ahead of that crucial meeting of the NPP tomorrow, and that's what Duke Mensa Poco has been giving us some uh, indications of what will be the main agenda and the names that are already being considered for the leadership of the majority caucus in, in parliament. Now, uh, Duke Mensa Poco, thank you, as always. And you're going to be there for us, so certainly we'll get some more information after that meeting tomorrow. Thank you to you as well. Komla Kluche, appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. A number of the members of parliament have been talking about this as well. The likes of Al Hassan Suheni, and then also uh, you have Samuel Atachi as well. They've been talking about this, and um, it's going to be on your screen right now. Some quotes that have been attributed to these members of parliament talking about Oseche Mensa Bonsu's resignation. Take a look at this. This is what Ahasa Suhin is quoted to have said that he will go down, that Oseche Mensa Bonsu will go down in history as one of the very thorough MPs that we have ever had in the Fourth Republic. His attention to detail and his contribution to legislation cannot be overemphasized. That's Ahasa Suhin, Tamale North member of parliament. Uh, you also have. Uh, Samuel Atachia also talking there uh, earlier today. Take a look at this. This is what Atachia has quoted to have said, that he was very surprised because he felt, considering the times that uh, they are in as a majority caucus, we, they can't do things like that because their situation is a bit precarious if you look at their numbers and that of the NDC. And he felt it was too late in the day to make changes to crush the unity. So he was a bit surprised it happened, unquote. So that's Samuel Atacha uh, also stating his surprise. That, that chorus has been repeated by many people uh, on this matter. But we'll see by close of day tomorrow, all things being in call, how things will play out. Because on Tuesday, all things being in call, President Okofado is expected to deliver the State of Nation address. And the leadership of the parliament has to be in full flight. Both majority leader has to be there, minority leader has to be there, together with the speaker, to welcome the president to parliament. We'll see. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, anti-corruption agencies demand a forensic audit into the Bolch de Japa deal, which will under, we understand has cost the state some $12 million already, with, with nothing really substantial to show for it. And... Uh, this is a matter that we are going to sink our teeth into because already this Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, they have given indication of inviting the MIIF uh, CEO after one week if they don't get the information on this Ejapa deal and how the $12 million was expended. Adam Senanu is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. He joins me right after this quick break. Stay with us. This is Ghana Tonight. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. And anti-corruption agencies are demanding a forensic audit into the Bochi de Japa deal, uh, which we understand, at least based on the responses to one, says uh, that the questions that the members of the Public Council Committee asked of the Minerals Income and Investment Fund CEO a little over 10 days ago, some $12 million have been spent already. And questions have been raised about who exactly was paid as part of this $12 million, what type of expenditure was this $12 million uh, spent on or expended on? The, the, the NDC has indicated that they are going to investigate this matter if they should win election 2024 to prosecute, if so, found persons uh, who, who would be found culpable of any wrongdoing in this matter. But the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament has also issued a statement indicating they're gi giving a one-week ultimatum, that's what you have on the screen there, one-week ultimatum to the uh, Minerals Income and Investment Fund CEO to furnish the committee with some further and better particulars, some details to this. They expect the information to be delivered to the Secretariat latest Tuesday, 27th February, 2024. It's that same day that all things being called, President Kufuor is expected to deliver the State of the Nation Address, 27 February. The purpose of this request, they say, is to guide the Select Committee on Mines and Energy 
on the appropriate steps to take in respect of the said allegation on this Ijapa deal. Now, Adam Senano is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement uh, Against Corruption. Uh, is joining us uh, on the telephone. Senano, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. I mean, we've seen these types of revelations every year at the Public Accounts Committee and public funds diverted into private pockets or expended on certain transactions that we don't have clarity on. For you, civil society organizations, certainly something must change. We must get another level of accountability to this, is it not? Absolutely. And uh, um, I, I, it looks like this needs, uh, this is a kind of thing that needs uh, a forensic audit. Let's, let's get to the, to the minutest detail. Um, uh, I remember how we're really concerned about the projections. Uh, we asked for the assumptions we're not given, uh, and so civil society was united that this thing is not good for Ghana. Here we are. I mean, one would not have imagined that as much as $12 million had already been put into this, into this, in this so-called deal. Um, so it's, it's actually shocking to hear these details at this point. Um, and if PAC knows that it doesn't have the space to, to do a thorough investigation, I think we ought to be demanding, you know, a very detailed audit of what transpired, who was involved, so we can wrap our minds around what has gone on. And if there has to be prosecution, let's make sure that people are prosecuted. This shouldn't wait for a new government. It's something that ought to begin to be investigated thoroughly and sanctions applied even now if necessary. But, you know, it doesn't not get worrying that in some cases, even before the Public Accounts Committee, we see persons who have diverted public funds into private ventures being asked to refund the money. And that's, that's the only punishment. How deterrent is that? I think that because it is in the bottom of the Public Accounts Committee at the moment, we probably need to give a few more weeks for them uh, to have gotten to a point where uh, another entity taking it up may be a, a useful thing. I think that we probably may not be helping the process if we ask a different group. Even though, in my view, the Public Accounts Committee may not be seized, eventually when we get all the details, it may not be seized with all the time and resources to do a thorough investigation, and at which point perhaps we would need something like the Office of the Special Prosecutor or some other entity to look at it more thoroughly. But at this point, we probably need another two weeks or so to see whether the information, the additional information they have requested will be provided so that we have some clarity on how come this money was even paid in the first instance. So uh, a forensic audit is what has to take place uh, so that if there are any prosecutions, it has to take place, at least in the interest of accountability and for the benefit of the Ghanaian people, is it not? Very concerning, um, because at the point where uh, the, the, the economy is lacking resources, uh, taxes have been increased uh, here and there, we are all feeling the pinch, um, and you find that people have been apparently complacent or lackadaisical in the management of our affairs, uh, and when even we had um, interventions that all of us as Ghanaians said, this is not good for Ghana, as much of our resources as $12 million, $153 million or so Ghana cities. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Um, and the sooner we begin to set the right examples and precedents, the better for all of us. It cannot be that people get away with murder all the time in this country. So we definitely need those further and better particulars to understand how come, in spite of all the outcry that, that occasioned this particular deal, how come we still spend as much as $12 million? It just is not uh, comprehensible. Ms. Anna, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. It's a co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, Adam Senanu, there joining us. And then also we're getting information that he uh, also is now a member of the AU Advisory Board Against Corruption.
Madam Tonano, thank you for that information. And coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, the National Petroleum Authority has intervened to review its monitoring of products from Centio Oil Refinery after it emerged the products available on the market from the refinery does not conform to standards. We hear from the civil society organizations that were first to blow the alarm on this matter and especially and some of you as well who have been victims of this uh, your vehicles some vehicles owners are as well also reporting of uh, some engine challenges as a result of the fuel that uh, you, you bought from certain oil marketing companies that got the fuel from this um, central oil uh, this is, is quite concerning uh, to say the least now the national petroleum authority has been talking they have suspended the approval giving to the, the Chinese oil refinery company, Center Oil, to sell some finished petroleum products, I'm talking about petrol and diesel, on the Ghanaian market. Now, the action is specifically targeted at some finished petroleum products, petrol specifically, with a dispute of not meeting industry specifications. This comes on, on the back of allegations by some civil society organizations that refineries' products on the market are unwholesome. So, uh, Obeidala Saeed is the head of quality control at the Natural Petroleum Authority. He spoke to Joy Business earlier today. Take a look. Through our independent verification, found out that some of the quality parameters in respect of the said petrol were a bit different from what was contained in the quality certificate. I must say that it is not a product that is unwholesome. The issue at stake is about the pressure being a little two points higher than the maximum requirement. And because products are commingled at the retail outlet, you have a number of these stations already having stocks where the pressures were low. And once they added it to the product, the resultant product is good and it is not, and therefore it is not all the stations that have experienced this product. But we've already held meetings for the central refinery and we have now reviewed the monitoring regime, which is to the effect that going forward, we will be countering all the quality certificates that will be submitted to the MPA. Okay, so let's get on to the, the telephone now, in fact, because a number of you have been sending us messages, especially from the parts of the Ashanti region, some of you uh, vehicle owners, indicating that your vehicles developed some challenges as a result of the fuel that you bought from some uh, fuel stations. Now we do know the origin or the source of this fuel. Dan Kanamwa is a uh, executive director of the Chimpa of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, uh, they, together with the Institute for Energy Security, blew the alarm on this matter just about 24 hours ago. He's joining us on the telephone. Zedankan, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Hello? Duncan, good evening. Can you hear me? Fortunately, we'll try to raise Dan Kanama on the, on the telephone to, to speak to us on this matter here on Ghana tonight. Uh, but we've just received a statement from the NPA, and we're going to put that on the screen right now. This statement came through minutes ago. Uh, the, the, the National Petroleum Authority uh, court taking notice of a statement issued by the Institute for Energy Security and the Chamber for Petroleum Consumers in respect of a consignment of petrol sold to some oil marketing companies, the NPA responds as follows. The NPA has at all material times enforced the rules and regulations uh, governing the industry fairly. That's what the NPA is saying. Uh, Duncan Amor is back on the telephone. Zamo, can you hear me? Yes, Alfred, I can hear you. Good evening to you. Good evening to your viewers. Well, this one... Uh, Great stuff. Well, uh, you first put out this, this caution that authorities had allowed Central Oil quote, to sell substandard fuel to some oil marketing companies, resulting in serious damage to the engines of some vehicles. I'm quoting from this statement. Does the NPA's suspension of Central Oil's refinery's approval uh, settle the matter in any way? 
Well, Alfred, we would have wished that uh, we could settle this matter uh, without further recourse to any form of restitution, but clearly uh, we've already made uh, attempts with our lawyers uh, to seek justice for the numerous people, uh, including the people in the media fraternity, uh, who within the past few days have had challenges with their vehicles or engines as a result of this bad fuel confinement uh, that the NPA wants to water down, uh, if you read through their statement again, uh, suggesting that it was 0.2 above tolerance. And so mm -hmm. uh, they are taking steps to, as they were, correct it and that it wouldn't harm anybody. Then in the same statement, the NPA concludes by saying, uh, they clearly, uh, beyond just redrawing the product, uh, applying sanctions uh, to Central Oil Refinery Limited. So there's some contradiction in there. If there's really nothing wrong, why apply sanctions? There clearly uh, is some parameters that uh, this new refinery, the Chinese-run refinery, uh, decided to, as it were, uh, clearly violate, because as we have already indicated, Leaving your refining in the hands uh, of, you know, the private Chinese uh, person could simply get to a point where things will get messy. Uh, we didn't have to take even three months after commissioning uh, to get to this point. So clearly, uh, there's been some infraction. There's been some violations. People have suffered a consequence. Uh, mm -hmm. Some engines clearly have had to malfunction. And uh, we will be seeking uh, justice for and block. Uh, for the people uh, who have been badly affected uh, by this bad fuel that the NPA and the Association of Oil Marketing Companies uh, clearly indicate has caused a lot of discomfort even to their operations. Now, uh, that, Alfred, we, are not, we are not done with it. No. I, I see, but uh, the, with respect to the statement that's just come through from the NPA, which you made reference to, the point two and three of that statement it's quite curious, and I just want to read this to the benefit of our, of our viewers. That they say, quote, beyond the construction permit, the NPA issued Central Oil with a test run authorization in October 2023, based on a report by its technical team. So they are saying that your assertion that Central Oil had only a construction permit is not true. But then again, they say a test run permit allows the refinery to put products on the market based on the national standards. I mean, how, how is it possible that if you're doing a test run of a refinery, they can actually sell the end product of the test run to the unsuspecting public, and now it turns out to be substandard, and the people are bearing the brunt of it? How come? Alfred, uh, there's an apparent deliberate attempt by the authority to whitewash uh, the issue and to suggest that while well, uh, Centro has done nothing illegal, uh, let me point to the NPA that first run globally uh, for refineries are not period, they are not processing uh, licenses or marketing licenses as the BDCs and the OMCs would come to you for. Absolutely. Uh, if a plant is the first run, Alfred, you are simply telling the plant uh, to do every little checks and balances to ensure. Uh, you know, pressure points, uh, if they are refining, uh, you even sometimes would need to just leave uh, a lot of pressure liquids uh, in the pipelines to see if there are leakages here and there. Uh, it doesn't take just two weeks or three months or two months uh, to say that uh, they have conducted a test run and already they are producing product, the product is coming to the market. That's not, not withstanding. Let me point out to the NPA that when the BBCs bring products to the market, you know what happens? There is a kill and kill done, which is the quality and quantity certification uh, where the certificates from laboratories, uh, the origin of the product or the source where the product is coming from. Then mm -hmm. there's a retesting here done uh, to be sure that the product is wholesome before you put on the market. True. If Centro could not, I mean, do a kill and kill, finish the authority or everybody else concerned, you know, with a quality certification of what exact parameters they were putting on the market. And then they go ahead to inconvenience not only uh, the oil marketing companies who had to buy from them and 
some of whose pumps currently are grounded, as I speak with you. Because mm -hmm. even to reverse the product back out of, you know, the underground tanks is a problem. If so, you pass this product through the pump island, you know, the right. dispensing pumps, the pumps are developing issues. So you can imagine what will happen uh, to engines that probably would have taken this product. So clearly, there's an infraction, there's a breach, through and through testing, uh, quality quantity uh, assessment that ought to have been done, clearly have been violated. True. Somebody has gone ahead to right. pump on wholesome products, and MPA is picking to whitewash this. Uh, so, that, so, will be, that, that will not certainly be the end of this. Right. So you're saying you're, 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 you're seeking legal redress for the persons whose engines have been affected. Uh, are you taking on Centio or the N NPA? Alfred, uh, as it stands, the Association of Oil Marketing Companies are clear in their minds that even their members who patronize the third product have been so badly inconvenienced that it will come at a certain cost to them. Uh, even to refix some of these, uh, you know, the spending machines uh, that have had to, you know, run these products. I see. And if the MPA does not see the need to not only call them to, to order, but will seek to just try to watch the situation and say, look, uh, we have redrawn the product, we are going to sanction them, and that's... Oh. This time round, we'll be seeking retribution, we'll be seeking for justice right. for persons, including media people who have called already uh, to indicate that, that they got fuel uh, within the past few days. Their engines are flattened out. Indeed. Whatever central would need to compensate them, we'll be seeking that uh, in the coming days. Duncan Amoa, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Duncan Amoa, Executive Director of the Chamber for Petroleum Consumers there. This is Ghana Tonight. On behalf of the team, I want to say thank you so much for staying with us. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. My name is Alfred Okonsi. Do have a good night.